We had this situation, Hannah, where physicists had done an experiment saying that the speed of light is a constant, but they couldn't come up with an explanation how to explain that. Albert Einstein came along and he began with two postulates. Kai wrote, what's a postulate? A postulate is something that you're not going to prove is true. You're going to assume it's true and then ask what else follows as a result. So his first postulate, he said, if two frames of reference move with constant velocity, if you're moving with constant velocity, what's your acceleration exactly as a number? If two frames of reference have no acceleration relative to each other, then they will obey the same laws of physics. This is actually very profound. Uh, in other words, let's suppose you're sitting at rest at a kitchen table and you pour a cup of coffee. The coffee will pour straight down. What if you're in an airplane moving forwards at 700 kilometers per hour? As long as the airplane isn't accelerating up, down, left, or right, when you pour the cup of coffee, which way will it pour? Still straight down. Let's imagine, let's add some drama to it. Suppose you had a bowl of hot soup on your lap in a car. When will you be nervous about the soup splashing on you when the car accelerates? That We take that for granted, but this tells you, Matteo, what a deep thinker Einstein was. Einstein said, water behaves differently when it's accelerating, it sloshes. He said, you know what, there's different laws of physics for accelerating objects than there is for not accelerating objects. We take that for granted, but yeah, that's a good point. There is a different set of physics rules for objects that are accelerating because they'll slosh. You can try this yourself. If you're ever in the back seat of a car, if the car is going in a straight line at a steady speed, play catch with the person next to you. If you toss something across, it'll go straight to them. If you're accelerating and you toss something across, it will also move towards the back windshield. Or if you're hitting the brakes and you toss something across, it'll move forward. Einstein, a lot of his thought puzzles, his thought experiments, Matteo, involved glass trains. We're going to imagine glass cars and glass spaceships. So if you're in a car and you throw something up, as long as you're going at a steady velocity, it will behave exactly the same as if you were on the Earth. There's going to be no difference. There will only be a difference when you're accelerating but let's imagine this ball, in fact, let's imagine this person, instead of putting any arc on the ball, let's imagine this person is throwing the ball straight up and down, straight up and down, straight up and down, straight up and down. What would we see if we had, we're standing on the side of the road and this transparent van came past us? I think we would see the ball travel kind of a... a triangular shape. Liam, does that make sense? It would go up and down. The person on the van again would see it moving straight up and down, straight up and down, straight up and down. But because we see the van moving sideways, Luke, we would see it trace out that path. Is that okay? Let's put that in our back pocket. We're going to come back to it. Einstein's second postulate, he said, what if Michelson and Morley were right? What if the speed of light in space is the same for any observer, no matter what the obser velocity of the observer's frame of reference is, or what the velocity of the source frame? Light does not behave like a baseball. Light instead is a, the speed of light is a constant. If those two postulates are true, by the way, this here is why I've been telling you A is zero for the, uh, lesson one as well. It's because I knew that Einstein didn't know how to deal with acceleration yet in 1905 for his theory of special relativity. So we're going to treat A as zero for this whole unit just to be consistent. Okay. Time dilation. Uh, little note, the word dilate means to make wider or larger, or if we're talking about time, slower. According to Einstein's special theory of relativity, why is it special? We'll talk about that. 
a clock that is moving will actually tick slower. A clock that is moving will, slow, will experience slower time. And we have a name for this. We call this time dilation. So, Sahib, here was Einstein's clever thought experiment. He said, okay, you can imagine a ball tracing this shape out, but because light is giving us the problem, let's replace the ball with a beam of light bouncing between two mirrors, and let's make it a glass-walled spaceship. So we are floating in space at rest. We're all wearing our spacesuits. We're also going to have to imagine, Ella, that we have Superman eyes, that we can see what's going on as it zooms past us really, really fast. All right? He said, we're going to have the spaceship go to the right, a speed V, because we're going to generalize. We're going to have the beam of light go boom, 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 back and forth. And we're going to use one more concept. We're going to use the concept that a distance is always a speed times a time. What happened to the plus a half a t squared? Einstein said, I don't know how to deal with acceleration yet, so a is zero. Is it possible then that in two different frames of reference, identical clocks might run differently and that time might pass differently? Yes, this is one of the predictions of Einstein's special theory Of relativity. Why did he call it? Why is it called special relativity? It's a special case. A is zero. General relativity, which you also may have heard of, that took him nine years. That's when he figured out how to work acceleration in. The math for general relativity is crazy. Well beyond me, and I got a math degree. Special relativity, we're going to prove with math eight and some cleverness. So this figure illustrates an observer inside an imaginary, custom-made, glass-walled spaceship, made especially so that an outside observer can watch an experiment done by an inside observer. The inside observer is watching a beam of light bounce back and forth, back and forth. Put your pencils down, look up. So that's, like, so that's like the pendulum, the beam of light bouncing between the mirrors, and you could use that, actually, to build a very accurate clock. Then Einstein imagined what that clock would look like if it were moving relative to us. So what I'm going to have happen is Jim is going to be moved along the stage, <laughs> keep moving the clock, and then we can dim the lights and we can see what that looks like from our perspective. We're stationary relative to Jim. And we've also got, so there's a little box We're there you a can see, that's Jim's head camera. So Jim is seeing, of course, the clock in exactly the way that we pictured it when it was stationary relative to us. The light beam is bouncing up and down between the mirrors. But if you look, and we've got a sort of little video effect on there so you can see the trail, you can see that the beam of light that we see is tracing out a, a triangular pattern. A what kind of pattern? We can do math with triangles. It's called trigonometry. We can do some good stuff here. Next page. So here's the full setup. This oscillating light beam acts like a very accurate clock. And because light is the problem, it also brings the problem into our thought experiment. May as well face it head on. The beam goes from the source mirror uh, up to mirror A, back to mirror B, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. The inside observer measures the time for the light to travel between A and B, A and B, A and B, and they find that that time is T0. Since distance is speed over time, the distance, the ins... Well, you know what? What we really want to focus on is this triangle right here. We're going to redraw it on the next page. 
right here. And we're going to use the idea that I can write a distance as a speed times a time. I'm going to scooch back just a tiny bit. You can stay where you are. I'm going to say that the astronaut's stopwatch, whatever that astronaut time uh, measures in time, I'm going to call that T0. That's going to be on board the spaceship. And I'm going to call the time that we see, I'm going to call our time just plain old T. And I'm going to say that the spaceship is traveling a speed V. So well, what does that mean? If I go back here, this is what the astronaut is seeing. Bounce, 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 bounce. So that distance would be the speed of light, because it's a beam of light, times the time on board the spaceship. It'll be that. This distance is what we see. It's still the beam of light, and we have to measure the same speed. That's what Einstein proposed. So we'll see it traveling a speed C, but we'll time it differently. That's what our stopwatch is going to read. This arm right here, this is the spaceship moving to the right. The spaceship is moving at a speed V, and when we time it, we time it traveling for that long. What shape is this? It's a triangle. You know what? It's a right angle triangle. We can use Pythagoras, which, correct me if I'm wrong, you do it in math eight, don't you? Yeah, I told you, it's gonna be math eight. Now, what is Pythagoras? Pythagoras, you might remember, because it's alphabetical, it says A squared plus B squared equals C squared. It says short side squared plus short side squared equals long side squared. I should point out that this C is different from this C. I think I've mentioned occasionally we don't have enough letters in our English alphabet. We're going to have to reuse some of them. So as an equation, it's going to look like this. CT0 squared, the short side squared, plus VT squared equals, who remembers, what do you call the long diagonal side? It starts with letter H, the hypotenuse, CT all squared. I usually pause around here and I say, Carson, let me emphasize, I'm not going to ask you to recreate this on a test. I'm just walking you through it because it's nerdtastic. Carson, what does it say step two wants me to do? I want to get this by itself. I need to move the VT squared over. What's the VT squared doing? Adding, subtracting, multiplying it? So minus it over. The next line, I'm going to write this. The CT0 squared stays by itself. It's going to be the CT squared minus the VT all squared. Matt, what does it want me to do for step three? What does it say? I'm going to go like this. I'm going to put the squared onto there, onto there, onto there, onto there, onto there, and onto there. Your grade nine exponent rules. So I'm going to write it as c squared t0 squared equals c squared t squared minus v squared t squared. Liam, what does it say it wants me to do for step four? I'm going to go divide by c squared, divide by c squared, divide by c squared. Now, why did I do that? Do you notice there's a c squared on the top and on the bottom? Those guys will cancel. Do you notice there's a c squared on the top and the bottom? Those guys will cancel. It won't cancel in the third one, but I've gotten rid of some fractions and tidied it up. So the next line is going to look like this. t0 squared drops down like a domino equals t squared. And then this last one is still kind of yucky, minus v squared 
t squared over c squared. Ooh. Mateo, what does step five say I'm supposed to do? What? Look up. You learn in math nine, if you have something like this, x squared plus x squared y, you can factor out, you call it a GCF, a greatest common factor. You can factor out an x squared and you'll have one plus y. Remember doing that way back when? Okay, we're gonna do that with the t squared. So the t zero squared is gonna drop down like a domino. But we're going to factor out a t squared. When I factor out a t squared out of a t squared, what's left behind? A 1. Minus, when I factor a t squared out of a v squared, t squared over c squared, well, the t squared is factored out. Just the v squared over the c squared is left behind. Addy, am I going to ask you to rederive this on a test? No. Okay, so... And you folks all need to turn the page, I believe now, yes? Maddie, what does step six say it wants me to do? Okay, we're going to get, and I'm just going to stay on this page so you can see it. I want to get the t squared by itself. I need to move this bracket over. What's the bracket doing to the t squared? Adding, subtracting, multiplying, or dividing? How will I move it over? And so on the next page, what we'll write is t0 squared all over 1 minus v squared over c squared, that equals t squared. t what? Equals t what? Equals everybody t what? How does one get rid of a squared, one wonders. And so I'm going to square root the right-hand side that's going to do that. I'm going to square root the top. I'm going to square root the bottom. The top actually works out nice because you know what the square root of t0 squared is? Just plain old t0. This is the time dilation equation. Now you can make a little note, draw an arrow, and you can say on test. Everything from here on is fair game. This is the time dilation equation. It says this t equals t0 all over the square root of 1 minus. I'm going to write it a tiny bit differently. I'm going to write it as v over c all squared instead of v squared over c squared, and you'll see why in a little bit. Uh, I gave you that on your formula sheet, I think, did I not? That should be on the back page. That should be the first equation under special relativity. So do you need to memorize it? No but you do need to know where it is on your formula sheet. You spotted it, Mateo? What you will need to memorize is what each of these things mean. I don't think you'll need to do flashcards. I'll give you enough homework practice that you will just memorize it. So what is T? Time on stationary object. And you can put in brackets, that'll almost always just be back home on the earth. T0 is the time on board the moving object. I'm just going to say the spaceship, because that's usually what it will be, but whatever's moving. Tori, T0 is the time what? What letter does on board start with? What number does the letter O look an awful lot alike? I remember this, although I say T0, I always think T-O on board the spaceship. If you're looking for a stupid way to remember that. V is the speed of the spaceship or particle or whatever is moving. And C is our brief for the speed of light.
This is the time dilation equation that Einstein put forth. Hannah, we're going to use it. Example one, I like example one, I like example one, example one is a nice one. Spaceship is traveling at 85% of the speed of light. If one year passes on the spaceship, how much time passes back on the Earth? Hannah, you and I are going to do this one together. The first question I'm going to ask is, what is this asking us to find? T0 or T, and convince me. So read me the whole phrase, starting with the word how. Is that T0 or T? Go look. Okay, this is asking us to find T. Let's fall back on our good old T equals question mark. That must mean they told me T zero time on board the spaceship. How much time went by on board the spaceship, Hannah? And here's the nice thing. Uh, remember the abbreviation for year is actually A for annually. Einstein's equations are unit independent. I don't need to convert everything to meters and seconds. If I put in years, I'll get out years. So I'll go with that. Then I need to find the speed. Hannah, can you read to me that phrase that I just underlined there? Again, you're right. Again, read it. You're right. First thing I need to do is remember from math eight, how do I do math with a percent? I'm not going to use the 85. What am I going to use instead? I got to change it back to a decimal, 0.85. What's the two letter word starting with O right after the percent symbol? Do you know what of always means in math? It means times. With only one exception. The only exception is to the power of, then it's an exponent. I, I dove into this once because I'm a math nerd. When I was teaching math, I, okay, I looked at every other possible situation where the word of showed up in a word problem. They're all times, except for to the power of. And that one's pretty obvious. So I'm going to multiply. Uh, read me the next four words, starting with the word the. If I want to write 85% of the speed of light, that's 0.85c. If I want to write 98% of the speed of light, 0.98c. Okay. Let's write down my time dilation equation. T equals T0 divided by the square root of 1 minus V over C all squared. What are we trying to get by itself? Ready is. So let's plug in our numbers. It's going to look like this. T equals 1 all over big square root 1 minus 0.85C. And then there's going to be another C on the bottom all squared. Hannah, look up for a second. All of you look up for a second. Hey, Hannah, do you see? Do you see? Do you see? What do you see about the C's? There's not technically two of them. There's one on the... They cancel. Which is why I wrote the, that section that way in brackets. In fact, really what we're going to enter into our calculator is 1 divided by the square root of 1 minus 0.85 squared. And so now we want to get out our calculators. Those of you that have the fancy schmancy fraction button, you can probably just go fraction button, put a one on the top, down arrow, square root. Those of us that don't, I usually start in the bottom where the square root is. I usually go one minus 0.85 squared and hit enter. Then I go square root, answer button, and hit enter. And then I go one divided by answer. All of you want to try typing these in? I did not do this in my head. I just happened to remember. You get almost two years. I think it's 1.898. It's 1.90 years. Yes? If you've done it right, you should get that. If you didn't, you want to snag me. Anybody that did not get that. Okay, let me pause the video for just a second. So, 1.90 years. This astronaut 
How much time passed on the spaceship, Hannah? What was T0? So they went away for six months, turned around, came back for six months on their spaceship. One year passed. On Earth, almost two years passed. Oh, okay. Let's kick it up a notch. Let's talk about what real space travel will look like. I'd like you to imagine that you're an astronaut and you've been given a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. You're 30 years old. You've got a daughter who's five years old, but you're given a chance to go on a space mission. And as much as you love your daughter, you can't pass this up. You're going to leave on a space trip in the year 2000. Why did I pick the year 2000? Just to keep the math simple. I know it's in our past. You're going to travel at 0.99c. What percent of the speed of light is 0.99c? 99% of the speed of light. And you're going to go for six years as measured by you on your spaceship. You're going to go out for three years, and when the third year kicks over, you're going to turn around, you're going to come back for three years. In other words, from your frame of reference, T0 is six. How much time will have elapsed when you return? Okay, well, Ella, what does this want me to find? Time, T or T0? T0 is the time on board the spaceship. Yeah, okay, so let's write down T equals question mark. Time on board the spaceship, six years. Speed, 0.99 C. Don't forget the C, because it's the speed of light. My equation is going to look like this. T equals T0 all over the square root of 1 minus V over C all squared. Bonus, the T is already by itself. It's going to be 6 divided by the square root of 1 minus point. 99c over c all squared. Hey, Ella, do you see? Do you see? Do you see? What do you... Okay. Last time, I rewrote it one more time, but it's really just going to be this thing squared. If you don't want to rewrite it, you don't have to. Uh, crunch the numbers. What do you get? So, Mateo, let me, don't blurt out your answer. Mateo, you want to walk through this together with me? So, I would go like this. You got your calculator ready? 1 minus 0.99 squared. There's the inside the square root. It's inside the square root. So, square root, answer button. And then 6 divided by answer button. What do you get? 42.5 years. So what does that mean? Having left the year, the Earth in the year 2000, you'll return in June of 2042. How old will your daughter be? How old was your daughter when you left? Five. How old? How many years has she experienced? Forty-two point five. She's going to be forty-seven point five years old. How old will you be, Siobhan? How old were you when you left as the astronaut? How many years did you experience on board the spaceship? You'll be eleven years younger than your child. And that's what real space travel will be like. What does it really mean? It means they're going to be one-way trips because no one's going to want to come back only to see their child die of old age before they do. That, that's got to be about the most traumatic thing you can do to a parent. So if we do actually become a space traveling race, it's almost certainly going to be colony ships where entire families say goodbye to all their friends and they go and never return. Because you just wouldn't want to come back and, oh, everyone that I loved is dead. Well, that's nice. 
Interstellar played with this a little bit, but in Interstellar, the time shift was because of gravity, which is Einstein's general theory of relativity. We'll talk about that a little bit, but this is what space travel will be like. Put your pencils down, look up. Time dilation shows up all over the place, especially in how GPS works. How the heck does that work? You've grown up with GPS. Uh, it was not a thing until 1998, I think. Uh, well, sorry, it wasn't available to the public. GPS is run, at least the system that we're on, it's run by the U.S. military. And the U.S. military kept it for themselves for quite a while. In the first Gulf War, which happened, I believe, in 1991, uh, the U.S., one of the reasons the U.S. whomped on Iraq so easily is the U.S. didn't need to stick to roads. All of their tanks had GPS, and so they would just go trundling across the desert in whatever direction they wanted to, and they could still find their way to their target. Iraq had to stick to roads. If you're sticking to roads, does that make you an easier target or a tougher target? Much easier. And so you'll find old footage of long convoys of supplies on the road and U.S. airplanes just strafing the convoys because they're sitting ducks. Okay. The military didn't want to make it available for the public, but in 1990, I'm going to say three or four, there was a tragic accident. Airliners did not have GPS. Airliners flew by doing manual navigation. You looked out at the ground and you looked at landmarks and the coastline and you knew where you were. You, oh, there's a big mountain. I have a chart. I can tell you which mountain that is. I know where I am. If you were in the ocean, there were no landmarks. You were looking at your compass. You were measuring your airspeed, and you were using D equals VT to figure out how far you traveled. But it meant that in crosswinds and things, planes could end up off course. Tragically, a Korean plane ended up flying into Russian airspace off course, and Russia shot it down. All 340 people aboard died civilians. After that, President Clinton said, okay, we are going to deregulate GPS. We're going to make GPS open to the public and to industry. Oh, and to airline companies. So that's why you have, have access to it. But how does it work? Works like this. This episode was made possible by generous supporters on Patreon. Hey, crazies. GPS is pretty cool, and it wouldn't even be possible if we didn't know relativity. Back in my day, we didn't have GPS. We had paper maps we used to find our way home. Uphill, both ways. All right, I'm gonna stop you right there, Gramps. <laughs> anyway, GPS stands for Global Positioning System, where a system is a set of things that interact. In this case, a set of 24 satellites orbiting the Earth at an altitude of 12 and a half thousand miles. Each one of these satellites orbits the Earth twice per day. There are actually 31 satellites because, you know, it never hurts to have extra. You need some for redundancy while you're repairing other satellites. You still need to make sure you always got 24 and extra. But 24 is the bare minimum for a functioning GPS. To determine your location, there needs to be at least three satellites within radio contact. That means all three satellites have to be above your horizon. 24 satellites in total guarantees there will always be three above the horizon, no matter where you are. So what's with the number three? Is that like a triangulation thing? Nope, trilateration. Triangulation involves triangles. Triangles, three angles, what? Oh, sorry, sometimes the origin of a word just blows my mind. The Global Positioning System, or GPS, doesn't use triangles. It uses overlapping spheres. That's trilateration. Spheres are a little tough though, so let's, let's start with circles on the ground. If this location lets you know you're exactly one mile away, then you're somewhere on this circle. A second location tells you you're exactly three miles away, so you're somewhere on this circle. Since you're on both circles, there are only two places you could be, these places. A third location is necessary to narrow that down to one place, your location. Piece of cake, right? Unfortunately, GPS satellites aren't on the ground. They're in space, like way out there. 
That means we're not working on a two-dimensional map. We're working in a three-dimensional space. We need spheres. Your GPS receives a signal from these three satellites, letting you know distance. It then draws three spheres around those satellites and looks for the overlap. Can you see there's an overlap right there and right there? Why can we probably ignore this one? It's unlikely that you're in space. However, if you want the GPS to give you your altitude, it does need a fourth satellite to give you your altitude. That narrows it down to these two places. Three circles narrows it down to one place. Three spheres only narrows it down to two places. That extra dimension messes everything up. You could use a signal from a fourth satellite, but that's not necessary. We can guess that you're probably not at the one up in space. So we rule that one out, leaving just the one on the ground. And voila, we've got your location on the Earth's surface. Of course, if you also want to know your height above sea level, you're going to need that fourth satellite. How do those satellites send you a distance? Well, they, they don't exactly. The satellites don't know their distance from you. They're not even really communicating with your GPS. They're just broadcasting. Specifically, they're broadcasting their own location and the time on their internal clock. Your GPS receives that time, compares it to its own time, and then calculates a distance using the time delay and some simple physics. And I think I've told you time is always technically a change in, but we just get sloppy and don't put the delta in front of it. But yeah, same physics we've been doing, just with more precision. But this poses a problem, a big problem. We know from relativity that different clocks can run at different speeds. The faster you go, the slower your clock runs. Also, the farther you are from the Earth, the faster your clock runs. And before anyone asks, no, these effects do not cancel out in GPS satellites. If you graph the clock adjustment against the altitude, you can see they only cancel at 1,980 miles. GPS satellites are over six times farther, so the gravity effect dominates. Yes, those adjustments are on the order of nanoseconds, which seems pretty insignificant, but not to this calculation. The satellites transmit radio signals, which travel at the speed of light, because radio waves are light. Fast, fast! At their altitude, the total adjustment is 26.7 nanoseconds for every minute the clocks are ticking. That results in an error of 26 feet, and that's only after a minute of running. After an hour, the error is 1,578 feet. After a day, it's seven miles. Basically, GPS would be completely useless. So do we continually have to update the satellite clocks? No, 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 that, that would be totally impractical. What we actually do is design the clocks to run slower by just the right amount to account for relativity. Each GPS satellite has multiple atomic clocks on board to keep track of its own time. And they're monitored by whole teams of people that make sure nothing goes wrong. Except cell phone apps don't usually use GPS. Wait, what? Okay, as it turns out, when we say GPS, we should really be saying location services. Apps like Google Maps only use GPS as a last resort. Because it's slow. You could be sitting there for minutes just waiting for it to find your location. Nobody wants that. No, first it checks the ID on your Wi-Fi location if you have one. Then it does the circle trick from earlier using cell phone towers on the ground. Only after those fail does it activate your GPS to use the system of 24 satellites orbiting the Earth. And this whole system, it's flawed sometimes. There's a street in downtown Vancouver where you're surrounded by glass skyscrapers. My GPS always goes crazy there. It thinks I'm actually in Vancouver Harbor in the ocean. It's because so many signals are bouncing off the glass skyscrapers. My GPS doesn't know which one is the correct signal to target and use. And so it moves me over quite strangely for about 100 meters. And then suddenly I jump back onto the road, OK? I've clued in, I'm not in the ocean, that I'm safe, but my GPS is having a little panic attack there. So unless you've been in the middle of nowhere or you've dialed 911, you may never have used your phone's GPS chip. I feel so betrayed by language right now. Thanks for liking and sharing. So that GPS, we have to take special and general relativity into account. A couple more, we're done. Example three. I like example three. I like example three. Example three is a nice question. 
Suppose a spaceship is traveling away from Earth at 99.9% .9 of the speed of light. Back on Earth, 1,000 years past. Suppose you want to travel 1,000 years into Earth's future. How many years elapse for those on the spaceship? Lija, what does this question want us to find? So what does it want us to find in terms of our special relativity equation? Acceleration? I don't think so. I know what A is exactly as a number. What's A exactly as a number? Yeah, we don't know how to deal with acceleration yet. Pardon me? So look at the special relativity equation, the time dilation one on your green sheet. Right? Here's my question. Is it asking us to find T or T0? How do you know? Time on board. There you go. I knew you'd get it. Okay, Elijah, we got this. Let's write down T0 equals question mark. So that must mean, Elijah, they told us the time back on Earth, T? What? Yep. And that must mean they told us the speed, V? What? So 0.999, don't forget the C. Okay. Um, the time dilation equation says this, T equals T0 all over the square root of 1 minus V over C all squared. Elijah, what do I want to get by itself? What's the square root doing to the T0? Adding, subtracting, multiplying, or dividing? How will I move the whole square root over? So are you telling me, and you're correct, that the equation for T0 is T times the square root of 1 minus V over C all squared? You are correct. Let's crunch our numbers. The time on board the spaceship, if we want to come back in the year 3023, 1 minus 0.999C all over C squared. Oh, Elijah, do you see? Do you see? Do you see? What do you see? I cancel. You might be able to type this in in one line. Mateo, let's try typing this in in one step. So once you've written that down, Mateo, get out your calculator. Ready to go? It's going to be a thousand times square root button. And I'm going to have to open up a bracket because I got a bunch of stuff in the square root. One minus 0.999 square that. Close off the bracket. Elijah, let me know what you get. Sorry? 44.7? years. So 44.7 divided by 2 is 20. If you head out for 22.35 years, urch, turn around, come back for 22.35 years, you, Elijah, will have experienced 44.7 years, but you would have arrived back on the earth in 3,023. You would have traveled a thousand years into earth's future. You'd be older, but everybody else on earth would be very, it'd be very different. So it's fair game for me to ask you to also find T0. Let's do real space travel. Let's do a space mission. Let's suppose we're going to send some astronauts to Proxima Centauri. Proxima Centauri is the closest star. Proxima means close to Earth. It's 4.24 light years away. I know light years has the word years in it. You might think it's a time. Light years is a measure of distance. Oh, I like example four. I like example... You know what? There's going to be one just like example four on your test. I'll just be that late. Part A says, suppose we build a spaceship that can travel at 80% of the speed of light. How long will the spaceship take to get there as measured by stationary observers on the Earth? In other words, how long do we need to staff the control room to keep in touch with our astronauts? Okay. What's this asking me to find, T or T0? Say it, what's this asking me to find, T or T0? Yep. 
And now it's going to get a little bit strange, Seda. Um, we haven't launched the spaceship yet. We haven't done anything. We're not going to use relativity for part A. Instead, we're going to use the fact that the distance is 4.24 light years, CA. And the speed is 0.8 C. We haven't actually launched the spaceship yet. We're going to use not relativity, just D equals VIT, although since there's no acceleration, VI is just V. What happened to the half AT squared? Einstein didn't know how to deal with acceleration yet. And we're going to get the T by itself. Say, how would I get the T by itself? I agree. Sorry for that sneeze, those of you on YouTube listening with headphones. They're awake now. Yeah, it's going to be 4.24 light years divided by 0.8 C. Oh, Seda, do you see? Do you see? Do you see? What do you see? And I get just years left behind. That is time, which is what I was trying to find. The fact that the units worked out, I probably did this right. Everybody on your calculator, can you go 4.24? Divided by 0.8. How long will we say it takes the astronauts to get there, Seda? Yep. Okay. Is that how long the astronauts will experience on the trip? No. B. Seda, what's B asking me to find? Key zero. Now we have a spaceship moving near the speed of light and Earth at rest. Now we're going to use relativity. So we already got the T zero by itself thanks to Elijah. It's going to be T times the square root of 1 minus V over C all squared. What T? 5.3. 1 minus 0.8 C over C all squared. Say it, do you see? Do you see the C's cancel? So we're going to say it takes them 5.3 years to get there. How much time will the astronauts experience? And again, all of you want to try typing these into your calculators because I won't help you on a test. I had to get a little grumpy with a student this morning who was consistently, I'm tired, and they weren't typing it in. I, not acceptable. So I get, ha, huh, I can even go answer button times the square root of 1 minus bracket, 1 minus 0.8 squared, close bracket. Seda, did you get 3.18? It's a fluke that this is working out evenly, but I'll take it. It gets even stranger. How far away is this star? 4.24 light years. So if the astronauts took a tape measure with them, a cosmic tape measure, and measured the distance, they won't get 4.24 light years. Even though we say it's 4.24 light years away, they'll actually travel less distance. Mitchell's looking at me. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mitchell, what's C want me to find? Uh, sorry, Mitch Owen. Mick, why did I say Mitchell? Mitchelson. Owen. I'm looking at half your name out of the corner of my Owen. What's this want me to find? Go D equals VT. Our old friend. What's the speed that this spaceship is traveling at? 0.8 C. What's the time that the spaceship experiences? 3.18 years, you'll notice I do get light years as my units. How far will the spaceship travel? We think it should take them 4.24 light years of travel to get there. How far will they travel? It's just time for you to go to your calculator and start typing.
Give it to me all sig figs, please. This is how our universe works. Neela, if two objects are moving at different speeds, not only will they experience time differently, they'll experience space differently. It's why Einstein called it space-time. That's one thing. Don't separate them. Space is not constant either. It changes. The distance you'll travel through, the faster you're traveling, the more space will warp and be shorter. Yeah. This is our universe. We'll finish with one more question. Somebody in one of my blocks asked this. Example five. This will be our last one. It says, how much time elapses if you're traveling at the speed of light? Let's do the thought experiment. Let's imagine you're on a spaceship. So we'd like to find time. We'd like to find time on board. But we're going to let our speed equal C, not 0.9 C, not 0.99 C. Let's let it equal C. We're still going to use Elijah's equation. T0 equals T square root of 1 minus V over C all squared. They haven't told us T. I know, but I'm just going to, let's see what happens if we continue on. T square root of 1 minus, I guess V is going to be C. Okay, I can do this. Neela, what's C divided by C? Well, what's five divided by five? 10 divided by 10, C divided by C. So you can cross this out and just put a one there. In your head, Neela, what's one squared? What's one times one? What's one minus one? What's the square root of zero? This ends up being t times zero. What's anything times zero? <sighs> Mr. Duke, what does that mean? Okay. You may have gone out late at night on a clear night, and you may have looked up at the stars, and you may have thought to yourself, Wow, light from that star took a hundred years to reach me, or light from that star took a thousand years to reach my eyes, or light from that star took a million years to reach my eyes. Sahib, that's only relative to you. As far as the photons of light are concerned, they left, they arrived, it was instant. No time. Light is special. Okay, okay, fine. I'll even kick it up a notch. Sorry for those of you that are on YouTube. I'm going to turn the flash on on my phone. Now, for you folks, you all see, saw these photons just wink into existence right now. But the photons of light, because they don't experience time, they're seeing the Big Bang and the end of the universe simultaneously. They see all times at once because time is not a thing for them. That's pretty good. Come on. That's not bad. So even though for our stationary frame of reference on Earth, we say that it can take light from stars thousands or millions of years to reach us, in actual fact, relative to the beam of light, how much time has passed? Everybody. Nothing. Zero. We're going to pause here. If you want to get a head start on the homework on a separate piece of paper, you're already capable of doing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You're already capable of doing all the way up to and including number 14. If you want to get a head start. But this will be the homework when I see you on Friday, we'll finish off the lesson. In fact, your homework is going to be every single question here. So if you want to get a head start, you can kind of start now. You don't have to, but I would probably recommend doing these on a separate piece of paper. Ladies and gentlemen, our universe is cool.